Point of View is powered by Airtel Tigo Extra. Even our bonus data doesn't expire. You the film? Dial star 111 hash to activate now. Etel Tigo. Life is simple. Welcome to The Point of View. Here on this program, we get the right guests. We ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. It's an interactive show. If you're watching, you can contribute to the discussion. My name is Bernard Avale. We're having a special show today at a very difficult time for the world. The world is grappling with COVID-19, and no country has been spared of its ills. Different nations are rallying to science and religion to bring solace. My guest leads a very big church in Ghana. He is the chairman of the Church of Pentecost, a church with over 16,000 branches in Ghana, over 22,000 branches across the globe, 105 countries. He's in the person of Apostle Eric Nyamicha. He's talking to us today about COVID-19, the social response, the spiritual response, and the way forward. Apostle, great to have you. Thank you very much, Bernard. Good evening to your chairs. We are so happy to have you. It's been a, a great expectation to have you on this program. We're happy you, you are here. How are you doing? How are you faring? Uh, doing very well by the grace of God, in spite of the COVID. <laughs> Leading a church trying to bring hope to members, and also trying to be relevant nationally. I'm sure it's not very easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How are you managing that? Uh, we ask for the Church of Pentecost, our language is by the grace of God. <laughs> and so when I say by the grace of God, don't get uh, worried. If we are doing that by the grace of God. We think that it's a great opportunity to show the love of Christ to the world and also to display our spirituality. We can't be hiding in the church house. And somehow the church, we don't even have space to go to the church house. So we have to be out there displaying the love of God to mankind. So you, you were uh, appointed, I think, August 2018. You had 2019 grace period, and now you are zooming into <laughs> COVID-19. I mean, have you seen such a situation before in your many years of ministry, this type of global level thing that everybody is just afraid. Is this something you've experienced in your ministry before? Uh, not really. Uh, my father didn't, and I <laughs> and I have not had that opportunity. I've only read about uh, bubonic plague uh, in the 14th century, the Spanish flu, and all that that claimed millions of lives. But in, uh, in my time and in ministry, no, not anything like this. Mm. When you were appointed... I think one of the headline stories that quoted you said, I dreaded a day like this would come. Seemed as if you sort of knew, but you were also quite worried and afraid about the scale of the job. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that comment and <laughs> help us who are just ordinary church members understand the, the magnitude of a responsibility like being chairman of a church like Pentecost? Yes, it's a big church. Uh, it is a big church, and we have over 2.9 million people. Uh, to oversee such uh, numbers uh, is something else. It means that you are going to have to be grappling with challenges, problems here and there. And even though I knew, because God has spoken to me, um, that was around 1998, 97. And so I knew when I was in my second station. Um, that one is not to say that I'm a super person, but just for people to know that uh, leadership is, is a divine election and you are not the best of the people, but in God's own sovereignty, he has chosen you even before the time. And so he's preparing you for a season like this. So I'm not worried about COVID because God, in his spirit, he, he knows that I'll be the, the leader of the church at such a time as this. So in preparing me, he will fashion me to meet this COVID challenge too. I was going through your profile and I was, I don't know if you've noticed that if you look at where you've been, you've been to all the interesting posts. So your, your first post, as I know, was Dabuas in the Western region. Yes. And then you did Agona and Sabada Central. Central. Then you went to South Africa. Yes. Then you came to East Legon. <laughs> then you did PIWC Atomic. Yes. And then you did Tamale mm -hmm. in 
in the north. So there's not south, east, and west yeah. on your profile before yeah. you became an executive council member. Mm -hmm. Does that have any significance? This yes. your movement across? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but it's all in the plan of God. Everywhere you go is part of the purpose of God for your life. And so maybe because he knew what he wanted, he was preparing me for, he wanted me to have the experience of what it means to of the entire church so that when you become a leader, you were able to survey it well. Mm. Mm, that is why maybe he sent me to North, South, East and West. But at the time, I didn't know what he was doing. You didn't know what God was doing? <laughs> yes. But what is your leadership approach? What is your leadership philosophy as a person? How do you come to this job? Just to be like Jesus. That is simple. I want to be like the master. And so I don't try to be like a chairman. because I wouldn't know how to become a chairman how the chairman will have to walk and talk and preach. So I don't worry myself with that. But as I, I'm just trying to follow Jesus. So as I study the scriptures, look at what the master did, just trying to imitate him, that's all. That is my leadership style. Mm. So let's talk about COVID. And was it something that shocked you as a church leader or the church leadership in Ghana generally? How... Because it started in China, I think January, it was just like a news item. And by middle of March, borders are closing already. Tell me a bit about how you see COVID and where it came from and whether it was a surprise. Um, we didn't think that it would be like what it is now. <laughs> and so when we heard of COVID, it, we were not scared. Uh, but as it lingered on, and then churches were, were closed, and we had to now map strategies to meet and all that. Uh, it, it is then that we started feeling that this COVID has really <laughs> come to stay and is hitting hard. And so when it started, we actually were not bothered. We thought that it was one of those things. But when it was declared a pandemic, then we all had to sit down and look at what we can do as a church. So we started strategizing so that at least we can still have uh, some connection with God and church in the midst of the lockdown. Some would ask, how come the church didn't see this coming? Because he says the Lord will not do anything except he reveals it to his prophet. And when we go to Abraham, in, I think in Genesis 18, when the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was coming, he says, I, I cannot hide what I'm doing from Abraham, seeing that he is a just man and he will teach his children after him. Mm -hmm. So some would ask, and I think it's a legitimate question, how come the church could not see such a major pandemic coming? And it took all of us by surprise. Yeah, for us, we saw it. But let me say that God can decide not to reveal anything to any man. He is sovereign. Those things that he has graciously revealed to us, the Bible says, for our benefit. But he can decide to hide his face and not to reveal to any man. That one we should really understand. But for the Church of Pentecost, um, the very night that they started um, taking people to the isolation center that uh, PCC. Then we were able to connect because one of our prophets just gave a revelation at a, at a pastor's and wife's conference and that uh, there was this ambulance, three of them that were coming to PCC and there were dead bodies in the amb ambulance. The news broke that people were dying all over and the, those at the Pentecost Hospital are dying and I, we had to rush as executive council members, go to uh, Alpha uh, Pentecost Hospital to pray for the dead. And any bed that we touched, the person uh, came back to life. And so God spoke to us that something like this was going to happen. We never thought that we were going to give the very PCC as an isolation center. And when the ambulances were moving in there, then we connected it with that revelation. And so we are expecting healing and deliverance for those who have gone to uh, the Pentecost Convention Center. So he spoke to us. We may not have gotten the interpretation well at the time, but today we know that God revealed to us what was going to happen. And I'm guessing that's one of the reasons why you've been at the forefront of the national response, because it appears Church of Pentecost has done quite a number of things within this COVID period, with the convention center being the latest, but there are other things you've done, right? Yes. 
Um, it's not because of the revelation. Okay. It is because of the vision of the church. Okay. We want to possess nations. What we mean is that we want to equip the church members to transform every sphere of society. We also want the church to be relevant to society. See, the purpose of the church is to bring God's word to the society, is to, is to bring transformation to the land. Uh, in Ghana, we have about 71 plus of us who claim to be Christians. But the impact on the land is so small so far as Christian principles are concerned. And for us as a church, we think that our relevance is not just being in church and fasting and praying, but we need to impact the land. And so when we saw that this COVID-19 has come to hit the land, it was wise for us as church people not to think about our windows, that is our church, but we should rally behind the president and close the gate. And so that is why we decided to do so much for the nation, uh, even sometimes against our very uh, church members. Amazing. So the list I have here is, of course, the release of the uh, multi-purpose Pentecost Convention Center as a COVID-19 isolation center. In most communities that have tried to, some people have tried to give isolation centers, the community members have resisted. Mm. So how difficult was it to agree as a church to release part of the PCC for this thing that a lot of people are not happy with? Because they feel, hey, if you bring the isolation center here, it means you are bringing COVID to our town. <laughs> how did you deal with that? Yes. Uh, initially, we thought that it had asked uh, a very big thing, but we also saw that the, the, the buildings were just standing there, and now there is ban on mass gathering, and these buildings are not being occupied. And then secondly, uh, I, could, I could have this COVID. My children can also contract it. Any church member can be infected, uh, infected. So we thought that it is an opportunity to help the nation. And so we gave the place out without any struggle. And it is a bit isolated <laughs> from the people. And so we wouldn't have that kind of stigmatization. Nevertheless, we asked the MP to actually work uh, on the people, in the community around, so that when they hear the ambulances coming up, they're bringing people, they wouldn't rise against. Uh, so this is Gomua, Gomua Fete. Fete. Yes. So how many beds have you given for the center? For the, for the isolation? We've given five blocks. Five blocks? Five blocks. And we have about over 500 rooms. Over 500 rooms? Yes. And then we have over 2,000 if we're talking about beds. But depending on how they want to use the room, we have asked that maybe a maximum of 1,000 for uh, those uh, affected uh, who have already been compromised and about 300 for the health and security persons. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And this is in addition to donating, I think, a couple of, a few pickups to the NCC. Yes, we have not donated as to uh, giving it to them. Okay. Yeah, but we have asked that they use it for this period. Uh, we have seen events, uh, a number of them, over 20 of them, okay. but we have about 12 that have brand new. We just received them. And we thought that we could give those strong ones to NCCE so that they could use it to educate those in the hinterlands so that they will come to terms with what the COVID is so that they will be able to gather. So this is for the public the, education yes, public campaign edu using 12 cinevans. Yes, cinevans. And then we also gave a number of items, PPEs, hand sanitizers, and a number of other uh, uh, kids to Ministry of Health. We have also decided to, we have also contributed to uh, the fund that uh, the government has set, the COVID-19 fund. Uh, we have also contributed to it. And most of our churches in the other areas and regions, they've all done their best. We also have three hospitals and six clinics. And immediately we, we also had to go there and then try to give them some PPEs and all that. And so that they are also equipped to manage uh, the situation. This is the point of view. We're talking to the chairman of the Church of Pentecost, Apostle Eric Namiche. Within the COVID-19 period, we're discussing the role of the church general in dealing with society's problems and then Church of Pentecost specific mm -hmm. in the COVID-19 battle. And Apostle has been in office since August 2018. 
and we're just trying to understand the motivation behind some of these things. So you've donated PPEs worth 70,000 to health workers, 100,000 to COVID-19 fund. And then we understand that you visited the health workers and patients at PCC uh, and this, this, this month. <laughs> yeah, that was yesterday. You went to the, the center? Yeah, I went to the center. Yeah, because I needed to give hope to them. And I wanted to welcome them and to let them know uh, that they are not the worst of people and that Christ is still with them. Mm. So I prayed with them and also thanked um, the security person, the frontliners, uh, doctors and nurses for uh, the sacrifices that they are making for Mother Ghana. Mm. And I also prayed with them and shared the word of God. Do you know how many uh, patients are there? Yeah, yesterday I was told that we have about 150 there and about 100 um, health workers and security wow. persons. 150? Yes. And you have, one, you have over 500 beds? Yeah, so they are bringing some more. So these people are not just from the central region? No. They are bringing them from all over? Yes. For the, for the, the mm. convention center? Yes. Very interesting. Okay, they have, the other thing I've noticed is the president has been engaging with religious leaders a lot. Mm -hmm. What has he been asking you? And what have you been telling him? Because I've seen you and some yeah. of your colleagues at least two or three times within the COVID period in the Flagstaff House, uh, Jubilee House. Mm -hmm. w what is he asking you people to do? Yeah, the first one was when there was this National Day of Fasting. And so we went there to pray. So that one was just prayer um, to support and to encourage him. So some of uh, people spoke to encourage him and then we prayed in tens. The second one was a consultative meeting. We was asking us about um, when we think it's feasible for uh, the mass, uh, the ban on mass gathering to be lifted and all that. And I think for me, uh, it's a good thing because he's consulting. And so anytime that he comes out, you see a lot of uh, the stakeholders behind what he's saying because he has done a lot of consultation. So that is about what we were doing at the Jubilee House. Are you guys worried about the uh, ban and the effect it's having on, because normal church is meeting people. Mm -hmm. And since 15th March, we're actually in the seventh week of the ban, seven weeks without church, mm -hmm. as we know it. <laughs> yes. It must be difficult. Yeah, it is difficult. We are worried, but we are certainly not disturbed uh, because we know that uh, by and by and with time, um, we'll, go, we'll go back to church. Um, as we are not meeting, our economy too is being affected, the economy of the church. But you can't talk about the economy of the church without understanding the economy of the nation. If the nation's economy is flat, you can't even talk about church. And so we think that we should all help and then kind of sacrifice to save the nation. And so uh, it is not too good a time for us, but we think that we are sacrificing for a good cause. Soon, like the president has been saying, this too shall pass, and then church will be back as, uh, as usual. We are losing a lot, uh, we, but we have also devised certain means to reach our people. So as for church, church is going on. Wherever two or three have, have met in my name, Jesus says, I'm there in their midst. So we have family meetings, and then individuals who are meeting, places where it's allowed, uh, friends are also meeting in very small numbers, just praying to God. And we have tried to be con connect to our members wherever they are. I, I, growing up in Medina, I, you know it was Easter because Church of Pentecost would do a convention. Yes. And they would wear white, they would take over mm -hmm. the park. Yes. So if you wanted to know what time of the year, it was just go and see what Church of Pentecost is doing. Yes. How was this Easter in social distancing and lockdown, how, how, did you, how did you do it? How were you able to celebrate Easter? Yeah, we, we celebrated it, but not in the way we are <laughs> used to. <laughs> because the celebration of Easter is just blessing the name of the Lord for the fact that he came to die for us. So we celebrated it. Mm. Uh, yeah, at various levels, uh, family levels, individuals, we all celebrated it. Mm. And we are the reason for Easter. When God sits up there in heaven and he looks at us, he, he blesses, I mean, he, 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 we are the fruit of what the son came to do. And mm -hmm. so we are the reason for Easter. So we celebrated it, mm -hmm. but not in the way that you are describing. We actually missed that part 
<laughs> we missed that part. I, for one, I like the Easter conventions more than the Christmas conventions. And so we missed that part. We missed the festivities, the, uh, the public proclamation of the word, uh, our, um, the handkerchiefs that we will be waving in praise and thanks to God. We missed it. And we also missed our budget on the Easter convention. Normally, we will raise funds during Easter convention. And that budget alone uh, is quite huge. It's like why, uh, somebody's church's annual budget. To we support had, programs. Yes, to support programs. We needed to scrap that because we knew we were not going to have that, uh, that space for uh, convention. So that one too goes against the church's kind of finances. But like I've said, it is important to think about the nation than to think about your money and church finance. What is this COVID-19 situation teaching us about the church's role in society? I'm asking this because, yes, in Ghana, most of our schools were founded by churches. A lot of our hospitals were founded by churches. But if you look at the way the church has grown in the past 30 years, especially the charismatic churches, yes. compared to what the mission churches did, it's very clear that the rate at which educational and health institutions have grown in the first 50 years of Christianity in Ghana has not been replicated in the past 30 years. So does COVID-19 remind us to continue? Because, I mean, if you look at the schools that we attend, most of them were founded in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the new churches have continued the way the earlier churches did. I don't know what your comment is on this. Yes, maybe because by the time, at the time the charismatic churches came on board, there were enough schools. But they are not you enough. We need more it, schools. Yes. And it depends on what they came in to build. You understand? What they can, the strategy with which they, they have come on board. I think that what we are missing in this last 30 years is the national focus. Mm. Is the national focus. Um, the early missionaries actually... Um, taught us a lot about developing uh, the land. So they, we, they had uh, hospitals built, uh, schools and all that. But with time, we lost that uh, national focus. And so you see that the church is about building a big cathedrals for themselves and all that. But they were not thinking about, we were not been dwelling so much on the, on the development of the land. That could be one of the reasons why. Uh, but I think that um, every generation will have to look at what he can do. But the purpose of the church is for transformation of the land. As for this, I always say it. If the church is not relevant in society, then it is not the kind of church that Jesus came to build. This is a wake-up call to all of us uh, that if we are churching, we must see that the church is impacting society and transforming it with the values and principles of Christ. There is no need to separate the secular from the sacred. And so Sunday, people are holy. On Monday, uh, they, I mean, it's life as, as usual. So that is why we have churches scattered in this nation, yet we also talk about corruption and all that. If 71.2% of us claim to be Christians now, um, if we were actually leading that kind of righteous life, as salt and light, I think that we would not be hearing this corruption that much. I'm not blaming all this on the church, but I think that when the church becomes national focus and we actually dwell on righteousness, we will be able to solve these problems to a So when you say the church should be national focus and dwell on righteousness, mm -hmm. are you talking about, for example, focusing not just on the spiritual but also the societal and social, because up until now, when you go to a typical church, the preaching is typically repent, give your life to Christ, live a holy life, pray, do spiritual things, versus there's somebody mm -hmm. poor in your neighborhood, go and feed him. Somebody mm -hmm. doesn't have a job, what can we do mm -hmm. for the person, and that kind of thing. So are you sort of saying that that balance must be looked at again? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, I'm saying that. We shouldn't say that this is spiritual. This is societal. Because Christianity is a way of life. You understand? And so whatever you do at your workplace is as spiritual as the worship you did on Sunday. Mm. Yes. 
Mm. Yeah, it is the separation that is bringing the problem. So people think that it is in church that we have to be sanctimonious, just worship God. And on a Monday, they have nothing to do with God. But you see, if you know that whatever you do, Paul says that whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. So as a media person, you are worshiping with what you are doing. As we are, we are discussing, we are worshiping. Mm. Because worship is whatever you do. Mm. So as you do it like that, it will glorify God. When this mentality is kept in the members and church people, we will transform the land. Yeah. So you're saying that I'm in ministry as yeah, a media man? Certainly. You see, if you have to even limit ministry to the fivefold ministry, to the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, we'll be rendering about 95% of the church population irrelevant. But you see, this fivefold ministry is to teach and release the entire church, entire church into ministry. Ministry is what happens outside the church house. Mm. So if you are in a choir, it is not a ministry, it's an in-house service. You are just supporting the church to be stronger so that we can go to do the ministry that Christ has given us. So we are in ministry. I, I'm also in ministry. Uh, people think that when you are a pastor, and then you are in ministry, you are better than the one who is in the media or the finance person. No, all of us should know and seize the space that you have as an opportunity of ministry and then shine and bless the Lord there. So is that why you launched the five-year strategic vision? And is that why we are seeing things like the environmental care, prison and this type of things that you, your, your people you are doing? Yeah, that is one of the reasons why. Uh, because I want us to change the way we see church. Mm. Yeah. You see, the church that Jesus wanted to build, Paul says that his purpose was that now through the church, uh, the principalities and powers will know the manifold wisdom of God. When you're talking about principalities and powers, you are talking about forces that govern nations. You understand? And so through the church, so the church is not an end in itself, it's a means to an end. So you don't just concentrate on church and leave the nation. God's intent is to save the nation. And he uses the church to save the nation. And so that is why we are now moving outside the church to transform the land. Mm. And we can do that with the salt and light that we are in him. Mm. Yeah. So why prison and why environment as two of the things you are focusing on, I think, in the past year or two? Yeah, we want to contribute to a society where people are God-fearing. We want to contribute to a society where people understand what it means to keep the environment clean. We want to contribute to a society where we care about the downtrodden and the, the, the marginalized. So we are looking at the environment. We have done an environmental uh, care campaign. We did it in 2019. And then this year, we also repeated it. But the difference between this year's and last year's was that um, this time around, we we involve the stakeholders, okay. we involve the chiefs, the MPs and the municipal chief executive, the DCs and all that, the assemblymen and any, any person that we thought mattered in the society, we involve them. Because we didn't want to just sweep and people will say that, no, let's make the place that next year Pentecost will come and clean. But we wanted the stakeholders to come on board so that we strategize, mm. find ways and means to keep the community uh, clean. That is why we involve them. And we think that as we keep on doing that, it will means make an impact. Mm. Make an impact. The vision is to make an impact not only in the church, but in the entire society. When we are talking about the prisons ministry, for us, sinners are our clients. Yeah. The worst we say, it is sinners who buy them. Mm. And many times we will spend money, we will go and buy instruments, we will go out looking for sinners. Mm. Now, we decide now to build a place and decongest the, Ghan the Ghanaian prison or the Ghana prison. And then we take a number of them there. We partner with Ghana prison. And now we have people we call sinners. Uh -huh. And so we minister to their heart because the structure that we are building, the holding facility that we are building, is going to take between 200 and 400. Um, we, have, we have started four already in the country. And we also have a place for, we have a chapel. Wow. And then we will turn the chapel also into a classroom. Wow. 
Wow. So those who can write um, for BC and they are qualified, we will help them to do that. WASI will help them to do that. And wow. even at the tertiary level, we have volunteers who will help them to do that write and pass. Prisoners? Yeah, prisoners. Writing exams? Of going course. to church? Yes, they are not the worst of people. Wow. I could have been there. Jesus said, I was in prison. He didn't come to visit me. What he was saying simply meant that he wanted to draw our minds to mm. the people we think that they are condemned, wow. that they are not. And then we also have a, a workshop where we give them some skills training. And then, of course, we have a sick bay and all that are tied to the kitchen. So that when they come out, mm -hmm. they will come out as people who can contribute to the society. Mm. And then they will no longer go and steal or do cause crime to wow. be brought back to the place. Yes. Impressive. This is the point of view. We are talking to the Apostle Eric Nyamiche. He's the chairman of the Church of Pentecost in an era of COVID-19, <laughs> talking about the work they are doing in society. When we come back, we'll do a bit of theological conversation as well. He's already explained the social role of the church and the righteousness and then possessing the nation's issue. But we'll also discuss where COVID-19 came from and also the issue of prayer and some of those other difficult questions that we have. Stay with us. Data, extra minutes, and extra unlimited calls. Not just that. Even our extra data doesn't expire. See the film? Simply dial star 111 hash to bundle now. Airtel Tigo. Life is simple. Welcome back to The Point of View, and today we are having a special chat with the chairman of the, Apostle, of the Church of Pentecost. I don't know why I mentioned Apostolic. Of course, they were the same people until, I think, 1962, mm -hmm. and they are part of the same family tree, mm -hmm. so it's, 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 it's not a problem at all. My name is Bernard Ablem. My guest is Apostle Eric Namiche, and thank you so much for staying. Some very interesting numbers just going through. So, almost 3 million members worldwide. Yes. Um, 100 and 50 worldwide countries. is 3.4 million. 3.4 million members worldwide. 150 countries. 105. 105. 105 countries. Uh, 22,000 branches globally. Yes. About 16,900 branches in Ghana. Yes. That's a big organization. Yes. I, I think mm -hmm. it's, for us, a single church, the biggest in Ghana. Because I am looking at the size of churches, Catholic, Protestant churches. This must be the biggest church in Ghana. If we talk about numbers. Per church. Numbers per church is the Catholic church. Still. Yes, yeah, still the Catholic church. Okay. But if you are looking at number of churches. Okay. And uh, we've gone past Catholic church. Oh, okay. Uh, we've gone past Catholic church. Yeah. So you have about 3 million Ghanaians who come to your church every yeah. Sunday. 2.9 million, 2.973. In all so, districts of Ghana? Yes. And Church of Pentecost is a Ghanaian church, started in Ghana? Yes, an indigenous church. Um, it was Reverend James McKeon, okay. an Irish uh, missionary who came to Ghana. And like the history, we arrived in 1937. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he was invited by... Uh, Apostle oh, wow. Enim, mm -hmm. who was the founder of the CAC, Christ Apostolic Church. And then with time, many things happened till 1st August 62, when we assumed uh, the name the Church of Pentecost. And so since then, we have been moving out without any white man's support. He actually taught us not even to take loans from the banks. And wow. ever since, we have never... Wow. taking any loan anywhere. We have been self-supporting, wow. self-governing, self-propagating. How have you done this? I mean, Pentecost reminds us of Acts. 
Acts talks about people sharing, nobody having any need, selling what they had, and the apostles being the overseers. But that was a long time ago. How do you manage to keep things like not taking loans and then in a modern economy where you have um, all kinds of things you need to do because there are instruments you can use to build a big university. You, you have a huge investment bank and say, let me give you some facility to do the convention center. So how do you, how do you keep the acts of the apostles type of framework <laughs> in a 2020 world? Mm-hmm of cryptocurrency and all these things going on. Yeah, he is the Alpha and the Omega. You <laughs> see, we don't talk about the God in 2019 and a different God in 2020. No, not at all. See, let me just add a bit to the Acts of the Apostles. In the Acts of the Apostles, we are talking about the Acts of the Holy Spirit using men. You understand? Yeah, yeah so you don't see Jesus there, but you see the disciples who were being moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when we avail ourselves to him, mm. he is able to use us to do exceedingly, abundantly, even above what they did. And so we have just been relying on God, trusting him to lead us. And this big facility, the Pentecost Convention Center, we didn't go for any loan. Anywhere that you see our church, after we have dedicated it, we don't owe anybody, we don't owe any bank. And God has sustained us. In fact, we have churches more than any niche, any any church in this in this country. Sixteen thousand nine hundred branches. Yeah, branches, and most of them are housed. Most of them. They have are buildings housed. they built. Yes. Not like in some classroom yeah, or some house. We didn't go for loan from the bank. We are not saying that going for for loans are bad. No, but we have decided not, and God has been faithful. Yeah, God has been. How do you deal with the poor members of your church? Because there's a view that churches, and I'm not saying this about Church of Pentecost necessarily, but churches have become wealthy at the expense of their members. So the typical example they give is a church builds an university, and the members of the church cannot afford to go to that university. What do you think about that? How do you deal with that? Yeah. See, last year alone, we gave. 392 members of our church full scholarship to Pentecost University College. Full scholarship. And they, they are going to be there. We are going to have to pay their fees for the, the four years that they are going to be there. Every year, a number will go. And apart from that, we also spend about $2.7 million on the other universities. That is uh, an open scholarship for whoever qualifies apart from the 392 people that we specifically sponsored to our, our university. So it's not like we are becoming rich at the expense of our members. For us, the money we get is from our members because we don't do any other business. And um, when it, even in this COVID-19, we did our best and we are still doing what, whatever we can within our strength to minister to our members. Individuals of our members are doing it. Individual members of the Church of Pentecost are even feeding communities. Yes, can talk about Tobinko and the rest. They are feeding communities. Uh, just uh, three days back, they gave me uh, a, a name of one of our brothers in Atomic, PIWC, and he, has, he fed a whole community about 15 days in, in, during the lockdown at Domi, Domi Pillar 2. He did it from his own purse. And the church also did, uh, we are still doing a lot. So did the church also feed people during the lockdown period? Certainly, we, we did feed a lot of people. Even my local assembly, we have created COVID-19 fund. Okay. Just a few of us, we, we were able to raise 51,000 just to meet the needs of the poor and vulnerable. And we have not touched this money yet because individuals amongst us are still doing it. So this money is still there even in reserve, yes. And so that is how we try to manage uh, the needs of the members. So in this scholarships country. is one thing. There are some churches that believe in teaching people how to create wealth as part of the gospel of Christ. They call it the prosperity gospel, and they have a biblical basis for it. Mm. Some also say the poor you always have with you, so they don't really focus on that type. Where is the Church of Pentecost's view on prosperity? 
financial prosperity. <laughs> yeah. We will not go to church and spend the whole three hours or two hours talking about how to make money. We will not do that. Because the gospel itself is prosperity. We, when, once you receive him, you have abundance of life. And the principles, he says, seek ye first the principles of the kingdom. And all these things, these are things. You see, Church of Pentecost, I will take the church uh, uh, for the, the institution of our church, for example. We sought God. And those the people thought that uh, we didn't even know how to preach and you know, it's all about prayer, it's all about the Holy Spirit. Look at the worth that God has given us. We wouldn't go to church doing that. We are not against the uh, prosperity gospel, but the gospel itself is prosperity in it. So don't take the prosperity and then magnify it as if it's all about the gospel. Once you take people to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Bible says that God says all other things, including money, shall be added unto you. We are talking about hard work, honesty, and all that, integrity. As we preach all these things and we do it, God backs the faithfulness of his people with worth and grace. And so that is what we do. And we are not against the prosperity gospel. That is not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that the gospel itself is prosperity. Because we've seen some of the very successful entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. Tobinko, Jospon, I think some other pharmaceutical guys. Yeah, a lot of them. In your church. I'm sure if you wanted to uh, fill a church with millionaires, your church has quite a lot of them. Yes, but we came from the fringes of society. Mm. Yeah. We, we, we have, when we go out and we are evangelizing, we sing songs like, Oji I here for, Oji I here for. <laughs> and then, so people come to us tattered, poor, mm. Mm. sick, but they don't come to us. We turn them over to Christ. Mm. And he makes the Tobinkos and the Zoom Lions out of them. Mm. And so um, that is what we have been doing. We have trusted the gospel. We have trusted the Holy Spirit. We have trusted Christ. He, we come to him. He gives us wisdom mm. to manage our ways, our day-to-day -day lives. That is why we have been able to have all this. If we go to the market, yeah, in a particular market, about 50% of them can be members of the Church of Pentecost. Mm. But this market, two men have built houses here and there. They have been able to send their children to the universities and all that. And so I think that God has been gracious to us just by staying pure and keeping our eyes on him, just staying focused on the Holy Spirit. He's done a lot for our church. Sorry, I'll keep going back to the past, but as you said, the people who were Pentecost people when I was young, they looked funny. Mm -hmm. They were always in Duku, and they would go to church and pray. The men would sit on the right, the women would sit on the left. And the churches were not that big. They were all very small churches. This is early 80s. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then if somebody went abroad and came back in 2002 to 2010, you'll see the church is completely different. You are seeing PIWC, huge church. You are seeing the Pentecost Convention Center, massive structures. You are seeing a lot of people of substance emerging. So in your own reflection on the church's growth, what do you think has happened? And when did the shift happen? You see, all these things is telling you that there is life in the church. You see, the presence of the Spirit in the church is life. And he is the creator. He knows the end from the beginning. So as we rely on you, he moves you even ahead. And so we, we have progressed over time. And it's all because of the leading of the Spirit. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank the leaders who, who have, have gone uh, ahead of, uh, who, went, who, have, who came before I did. Um, they were also really progressive leaders. And so we tend to scan the system and always try to drive darkness. We do a lot of meetings. What people don't know about the Church of Pentecost is that the leadership, we work very hard. We discuss the way forward all the time. And so it makes us move on instead of being, uh, staying at one place. Uh, we have over 73% of our populace as children and youth. You 73% of your population yes. is children and, and youth. youth. Yeah. 
Hey. So you can see that we, we I would wow. say that God has helped us. We have a lot of youth and children in the church. So we think that the future is still bright for us. Just because of the, we have tried to move with, with, with time. And we have not just slacked back at all. How united is the church in Ghana? I was surprised to note that the, 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 fast, the three day prayer and fasting that the church leadership in Ghana announced is probably the first in many, many years, if there's ever been something at all, where you have Catholics, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Protestants all decide to do a three day prayer and fast. And some will say it had to take COVID 19 and lack of church. <laughs> For, for this to happen. I mean, I'm young, so I don't know the history, but mm. it's quite shocking. Yeah. Why has it been so difficult for churches, church leaders to come together until this time? Yeah, because there was no COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> there was no COVID-19. We were all comfortable in our, uh, in our pews, and then we were also comfortable preaching our pulpits. And then this one brought the need that no, we need to fight this common enemy. Otherwise, everyone was trying to do his own thing, trying to sometimes even competing, wanting to be the best that, the best that. And we thank God for COVID-19. One of the things that it has brought to us is to know that we, we, are, we, are, we are nobodies mm -hmm. and that we all depend on our great God. And so we decided that let's come together. Let's come together and then declare fast so that all the Christian community will pray and fast. The first one was from the president, but those of us who claim to be the children of God, we have not said anything. And people are asking, why is our God? And so let us come together and pray so that our God will arise, mm. that this enemy of COVID-19 will be effectively scattered. So this is going to continue, this collaboration between the, the, the main church leaders in the country? We, we think that we have to move on that track because it has, it has brought us together. And the kind of closeness that we have built, uh, I don't think that we are going to be scattered again, not at all. And so we had started some talks, trying to bring the churches together under one umbrella. Uh, and this COVID-19 has kind of hastened it. Mm. And so I think that moving on, we are going to have, we are going to see a lot of this unity and collaboration. Some people think we don't need the National Cathedral it's a controversial issue, but they feel the amount we are investing in that cathedral can build hospitals, can be used to seek a vaccine or a cure. Where do you stand on this National Cathedral issue? Uh, I don't stand anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't stand anywhere. I think that people are entitled to their own opinion on issues. And so when the president said, I want to build a National Cathedral, people can have their own opinion on matters. But uh, for me, I think that uh, people are saying that because the, the, the lack of uh, roads that leads to their village and all that, they think that uh, we need more hospitals, we need that wide this. But let us pray that God will bless this economy so that we can have our roads built and the cathedral built. We should even thank God that we have a president who is talking about let us build a place where we can call a national cathedral. You see, when you see a church building in a society, it tells you that God is there mm. and that we should be proud of that. People say saying. God says, mm. I don't dwell in temples. In fact, they quote Paul famously who says that, you know, I think when he was in Athens mm -hmm. or somewhere and they were talking about different, the, to the unknown God. And he says, mm -hmm. but the God we serve doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands. And yeah. then he talks about your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He said that in Corinthians 3, mm -hmm. 6, and then 2 Corinthians yeah. as well. So there's a view that, the God's presence is not manifested by a building. That's Old Testament. In New Testament, your body is the temple. So why are we building even these monuments? And then that is not only limited to the cathedral. Then let us go and pull all church buildings down. Then that argument will hold. Solomon knew what you were saying. It's not today's crisis. This is not a, a New Testament stuff. Solomon, after he has built that magnificent temple, he smeared it with gold. Glorious temple. It, 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 it was famous. It was splendorous. He said that, God, I know that even the highest heaven couldn't contain him. How much less this building that I have put. But let your eyes and your ears be attentive to the cry and the prayer our people pray here. And I, I thought God was going to say, I don't dwell in this temple. 
But you see, he endorsed it by bringing the cloud of glory mm. on top of the building, and it entered it, the, mm. the temple, to the extent that even the priests could not enter. That was an endorsement. And then when God was responding to Solomon's prayer, he said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, then I will take this place as my own, and my eyes and my ears will continually be here. You understand? And so the, the building, this building we call temples, mm. they, are, they, are, they are places where we gather for God to minister to us mm. and all that. It is of so much importance. And when Christians have gathered together and the God is in their midst, oh, it's a beautiful spectacle. So I don't think that uh, we should condemn the cathedral with all these kind of quotations. Okay, let's try and wrap up and talk about a couple of things. So... What is the sig spiritual significance of COVID-19? Is it a punishment from God? <laughs> is it a sign of the end times? Is it a, a call for repentance? Is it, I mean, what, what do you, how do you explain to a Christian that something can affect, as we are talking, over 3 million people, 200,000 have died globally, and the numbers keep increasing. Mm -hmm. We don't have a vaccine. And nobody seems to have any answer. Is it? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Me too, I don't know. Yeah, but you see, uh, because we are born in this era, mm -hmm. we tend to question these things. But if you have to go back in history, you realize that even uh, what we are going through now, you can't compare it to what we call uh, the Black Death. It claimed two million people mm. in the 14th century. And even the Spanish, 50 million people. And we are recording 3 million and all that. 3 God, million infections, 200,000 yeah, deaths. Yes. And God has been gracious to us. Mm. He is gracious to us. I don't think that, you see, uh, the scripture says that the earth itself is groaning. Yeah. It is crying for deliverance. So how much more those of us who are living on it? And so if this world was a better place, Jesus would not have said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He says, in this life, you suffer. It's all part of the suffering. So these things come, and sometimes it's coming from the devil. Our own mistakes can also cause that, and God can also use this for his own purpose. I don't know where it's coming from, but whether it's coming from the devil or our own mistakes, God is still sovereign over all these things. Mm. And, and so I don't think that COVID-19 is a sure sign of the end time. Uh, but he has told us that in the last days, things like this will happen. But the surest sign is that the gospel must be preached to all the ends of the earth. And then the end will come. Even China, where the COVID started from, this COVID-19 started from, uh, the, the gospel has not penetrated that society. So I know that it's not the end. It's not the end. It's a preparation for us towards the end. But this is not the surest sign. Some people, some people have said that the church has failed because they talk about miracles and all these things. They sell anointing oil and all these things. And now a test has come and they, have, they don't have the answer. Yeah. You see, when we come to a place where we don't have the answer, the church is not God. Mm. The church is people who are born again. God is supreme over all of us. When we come to a point where all of us know that now we don't have an answer, then we tend to turn to the Supreme God. And we are not the first group that have come to our wit end. You see, Jehoshaphat says that, I see this army, and Lord, I don't know what to do. Our eyes are upon you. And so we come to that, that point in our life where we don't really know how to do. So people should not blame the church. We are human beings that God has chosen that we are not angels, mm. even to lead the church. And so all of us have to wear face masks and then <laughs> observe social, social distancing, distancing so that the Lord is God over all of us. I think that God is about doing something. And he knows what he's doing. As we are praying and petitioning, he will come in and have mercy. And then after this, I'm expecting a great harvest of souls. Up until now, people were not even, people don't want to hear God in, in, in people's mouth. No, they think that what is God? We can do our own thing. So we have become secular humanists. People don't think God. And I believe that... You think COVID-19 will change them? 
God can use that to shake, to shake the earth. And it will change some people. It mm. may not change all. Because Timothy says, sinners and evildoers will wax worse and worse. So for some of them, <laughs> the situation might even strengthen their resolve. It may not change them, but a lot more people will now bring God into their language. Mm. When president are throwing their hands in the air and they don't know what to do, and then suddenly through our prayer, God comes in mightily. Mm. He, he will do something about it. He will use every situation to glorify his name. What is God saying about when it will end? When it will end? I have not asked God. <laughs> but you should be asking him that <laughs> question. <laughs> no, I've just prayed and believed God. You see, but for the authority that we are under, that after these three days fasting, some of us would have gone out without face marks. Because we are by fasting. Faith. Yes. But we are under authority. So we have to abide by the protocols. Do you get what I'm saying? Which means saying? you believe that your mm. prayer has been answered. Has been answered. And then when we step out there in faith, eh, God will show himself strong. I believe that prayer has been answered. But we work on the authority. And we must use wisdom. Our faith is not of the same level. And so I am the I'm a leader of a church, but I'm under the authority of the presidency. So we, we still go with the... Uh, so you are expecting that. that the thing is going to decline? As yeah. in, you are not expecting it to worsen? Not at all. Not at all. Because we have prayed. Yeah, not at all. That is my expectation. But even if it worsens, it doesn't change God. But I'm expecting it that it's going to decline. Yeah, ever somebody was telling me that after the three days fast, he feels that uh, something has been lifted over his head. Even now, the fear of COVID-19 is going down drastically. I can feel that. You see, and prayer is maybe it's an answer to prayer. Now he's taking the load. People are, we have prayed. And the faith that people have that we have prayed. People are wearing the masks, but they believe that nothing will happen to them. I'm not saying that people should remove their masks, but I'm saying that after the prayer, a load has been taken off. I feel it, and I know you also feel it. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking to Abbas and Yamiche. We're about to wrap up discussing various things, COVID-19, the church, and society, and their vision, and all those nice, nice things. I mean, my last point is, so what, what do you think the, the next phase is? I'm, I'm looking on your wall, and I'm seeing McKeon, Safo, Yeboa, and to me, Opoko, Nina, and I'm seeing Yamiche representing different eras, and you are the Sith, right? And you are possibly the youngest in terms of at the time of appointment. What do you suppose, or what are you praying for God to do as the next phase of the church, and not just the church of Pentecost? What is the next phase of the church in the world? Because it's a big question now. Globally, there are tensions in the U.S. There's a clear split, and it's become very divisive as in those who are people of faith and those who are secularists, and it's becoming deeper. Mm. What do you think God's agenda is for the world and for the church in this time? I think that the world is not, never going to be the same again after COVID-19. For that one, uh, we are going to have to see things differently and work differently. That one, I'm so sure. And um, what is God's agenda? God's agenda has already been revealed to us in Scripture, and that in the last days, things like this will happen. And then this one is gradually drawing us to a close. We know that there's going to be a one-world uh, government. One, one government and religion and all that. And somehow, if we listen to news and the talks around, it can lead us there, but it's not going to be that immediate. Uh, but it's all going to fulfill God's agenda. That is the simple thing that I can say. So the agenda, match, the, 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 the God's agenda is on. God's agenda has always been on. <laughs> Every day you move into God's plan. You see, he never created this earth and he left it for us and then went to sleep. Mm. He is in his world. And wow. so whatever happens, he's not surprised. He is in it. And he will let all these things work together for good to fulfill his agenda for the planet earth. He created it. He wow. is, it's not American people who made it, nor China people who made it. Okay, to end, I believe in prayer, and I believe in the power that it has to bring change. So I'm going to request you humbly to pray for us, the crew, and also for the nation, since you represent a leadership 
anointing in the country. So, my viewers, please, we are praying. So, you may, you may want to watch, your, <laughs> watch the TV with your eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Father, we want to thank you for all that you do for us every day and night. We want to thank you even for what we have gone through in recent times. Some have, through this COVID-19, died. People have been bereaved. But we want to still thank you anyway, anyhow, that you have spared many of us. Father, we thank you. We have prayed to you that you yourself will wipe this COVID-19 from the planet Earth. And we believe that you have heard us. We are praying, oh God, that you hasten the end of this so that all of us will be free indeed, that we can go back to our normal duties. We pray for the presidency. Continue to give them wisdom as they manage, O oh God, this time. We pray for our frontliners. We pray that your hand will continue to be upon them. Bless their heart and bless their soul. Bless their family because of the great sacrifice they are making for our nation. Above all, we pray that you heal our economy too and let it be that it will bounce back that it will surprise many analysts to your glory and to your praise. We thank you for answered prayer. We pray, O oh God, for anyone that is hearing the sound of my voice. If there's anyone sick, if there's anyone in any kind of trouble, Father, touch and meet them at the very point of their need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. And that's all we have time for. We thank you for watching today's edition of The Point of View. Mm -hmm. My name is Bernard Avle. We'll be with you next time. Bye-bye. Point of View is powered by Airtel Tigo Extra. Even our bonus data doesn't expire. You the film? Dial star 111 hash to activate now. Airtel Tigo. Life is simple.